Hello, hello, hello. I wasn't finished with the yellow clay yet, so I thought I'm gonna make a video today too. And I'm going to make the astronaut finally. So that is what I'm gonna do. That is what I'm gonna do. A yellow astronaut for my alien spaceship four. Yeah, and then because I have another styrofoam package material of the same type and I have two more of those of the same type and I'm gonna make alien spaceships out of those so the next one is alien spaceship 4 and then alien spaceship 5 from the last one that Paul gave me And this astronaut is for Alien Spaceship 4. And I'm going to make another one for Alien Spaceship 4. And, and then I will make two more astronauts for Alien Spaceship 5. <laughs> Right now I'm painting the baby dog in sort of like an abstract form, but like a cartoonish type of form. And that's upstairs and I will show it when it's finished. I will take a photo of it and I will, I still wanted to put this on Insta Instagram. I still haven't done that yet, but I want to do it. Make an Instagram page for my art only. can't talk very much while I'm doing this. It requires my concentration. <laughs> so when I talk a lot, then I'm just squishing this in my hand. <laughs> and I'm not getting any work done with this astronaut. I can either talk or make the astronaut, either one. My brain is full of nightmares and terror stuff and OCD stuff and so on, all kinds of emotional pain from childhood and I'm constantly having to maneuver that around in my head and then having to do something else like talking about this here without getting too sidetracked. That requires a lot of focus. Yes, that is an astronaut. <laughs> the baby dog, he would like to have that astronaut. But you can't have the astronaut. You know, you can't have it. That does. <laughs> he thinks that's a toy. Yes, that's what he thinks. And when he looks at me, he looks at something. He has these. He has these cute cartoon eyes. <laughs> he, like, like a cartoon animal. That's an awe. Yes, I want to 
want to make this nice and shapely. I don't want to make the arms too big because then that takes away from the material for for the upper body. So the whole body really. So Need to make. I like to have the arms shorter. Yes, this is nice. <laughs> you would like to eat this. Baby dog wants to eat this. Don't give that to your dogs. It's non-toxic, but it has food colors in it and artificial colors. And that's not good for dogs. But all of my dogs were always crazy about my artworks. Partic particularly the the play-doh figures while I was making them they always wanted to eat that You are my everything. Yes. yes you are my everything. That is what you are. He is an astronaut. Oh, yes, an astronaut. <laughs> yes. You are my everything. Yes, you are. yellow
Okay, it's getting there now. It's very relaxing. I was thinking about the therapy help centers that we need last night when I was going to sleep I was meditating for several hours because we went to bed early so I was lying awake until about 12 for like three hours or something and I was thinking about the therapy help centers that we need in the world and I thought that in each one of them they should have arts and crafts programs that are not just there for people to use if they're only there for people to use like here's an art arts class or here's an arts studio for you to go into and use the vast majority of people would not use it particularly not men the men would not use it because they would think that that they would feel like that's not masculine or something to do to do a play-doh figure like this And that's all because uh, because society has drilled that into them. Okay, that has nothing to do with masculine or feminine. That doesn't even have anything to do necessarily just with being childlike, you know. So an adult can be childlike too, and that's wonderful. If if that's the case, that's what Friedrich Nietzsche was talking about. He said there are three steps to to psychological liberation you know, the first step is you become a lion not by putting someone else down not by bullying someone else okay no by standing up against the bullies by standing up against those that are that are fraudulently putting themselves into a dictatorship situation you stand up you say you speak out for yourself you stand up for your boundaries okay so that's the lion you it's you start out as a load-bearing camel that's what Friedrich Nietzsche said and you don't want to be a load-bearing camel you want and no camel should be having to carry any loads of other people okay and I mean this literally and 
also psychologically. So, so the first step is you have to speak out, you have to stand up for your birthrights, which is making a, a Play-Doh figure, you know, whether society thinks that's unmasculine or not doesn't matter, okay, you can still do it. And women should do it too, you know. They shouldn't think, oh, this is this is only for children. No, we can be children too, okay. You can do that together with your child. You know? Your child would love that if the mother or the father would participate in this. I think that's great. I saw on YouTube I saw a very sad story of a girl, little girl, was abducted while the, the parents were camping at the beach in Australia. Well, she was abducted by an Aborigine, Aborigines man, young man, reminded me a lot of that guy in Hawaii who who just squatted in someone's house and terrorized the family. But this guy, he he abducted the child while they were camping and I wonder if they had given, if I wonder if he had somehow sedated them or something so that they wouldn't hear anything. I don't know because I would definitely hear if someone was trying to unzip the tent and I don't know or maybe they were just so tired and he waited and until he felt like they were sleeping and he could take the baby away and the baby the daughter didn't make a sound and so who knows he may have put he may have put something a narcotic over them or some made them breathe breathe a narcotic but he he was a, that guy's a very mentally disturbed person someone who I would put into into the cluster A therapy help center which is for schizoid people and he had a humongous doll collection and he just wanted a living doll to add to his doll collection and they don't know what else he may have done to her so it's real horrific so but they got the the baby back everyone helped <laughs> if they were able to locate his house they were able to trace all of these steps back which is amazing amazing job from the police and also the local people that that volunteered and they got the baby back and uh, the mother said the, the daughter acted very strange very different and that's because of the trauma and the baby was absolutely terrified of going to sleep with the doors closed because he had locked her in into some kind of children's room with a lot of toys in the shelves that he had collected and he's done stuff with her tried to bleach her hair and color her hair pink and all of that she already talked about some of the things but I guess she didn't talk about the traumatic stuff yet and now she has this she's only four years old she has these anger attacks now because of the trauma and so the parents they're both very very amazing parents they they know that they have to be infinitely patient with her with that healing process and I saw the father letting the the baby girl put nail polish on his toenails and fingernails. And she did that with such 
meticulousness at age four. I was amazed. And that's very healing for the child, for the father to be allowing this kind of interaction and this child play and being showing his soft side, his his paternal maternal side, you know, was this for the daughter to to heal, you know, and I think that's very important to do this. Would be even better to make clay figures together. So and for my therapy process I was thinking so if we just offer this, you know, like a lot of therapy centers that are already existing in Germany and so they have they have art therapy and stuff like this. But it's not like what I have in mind, you know. It's not like something they can go to if they want to because they're not gonna go to it because they think that is not masculine, the men in particular. The women will, will use it, but the men will not use it. And they need it real bad. They need it much worse even than anyone else because they're the most traumatized and they're the most shut down on the inside. So all of these things, they have to be, they have to be mandatory. That, has, that, that is part of the, the entire therapy program. They have to participate with this. And when they have to participate, then they, they will go like, oh, okay, they will act macho and all of this, you know. But the inner child says, yay, I'm happy to do it, right? But the, on the out, outside, they'll say, ah, oh, it's bullshit and uh, it's for sissies or children. Or, but, you know, they have two sides of the brain and they have an unconscious and they have the upper consciousness. <laughs> and the upper consciousness is the, the conditioned part Okay, and that condition part says no to all of that because because they they would feel ashamed if they participated in it voluntarily, but if they have participated in it because it is requested from them by law, then they can't be objecting to it. They have to go along with it with that therapy program. And that's also something that the father of that of that girl of that the real the the people was the biggest house in the United States. Okay. They were on they were on they on they were on T V they had a TV show, real reality T V show. A girl made a documentary film out of their life that was became a re reality TV show also like a, a movie that's out there that that you could rent but it was also a re reality show on TV that was ongoing and I think that's very good that she did this because that family is a representation of what is neurotic in our society and you know father very busy always very busy not having time for the children they had like they have like 10 children or 11 children and the mother was a photo model they have a whole lot of money and they have nannies and housekeepers and they can they can barely keep up with all of that stuff so it's sort of like a representation of the neurotic household doesn't only pertain to rich people obviously so What happened then was the the oldest daughter, the daughter from her first marriage that was adopted by that investor. Ricky, I think they called her. And beautiful woman. 
she was about I don't know 18 or 19 or 20 very very young and she got lured into drugs by classmates and so on it got so bad she ended up in a rehab facility for drug rehabilitation and they don't really help they don't I'm, I'm gonna get into it more in, in depth mm. after this year I just wanted to explain what happened to them big wake-up call the daughter when she came back home she she was in love with one of the the guys young men that were also in rehab and he didn't tell her that he had a girlfriend and she was pregnant and she was about to give birth he didn't tell her any of that he just wanted to have another girlfriend so she was getting all excited meeting him getting married to him and was all in love when she got an email from his girlfriend and the girlfriend said he didn't tell you that I'm his girlfriend I'm pregnant and he should be there for his child and she used some bad language or she was really really mad not necessarily so mad at the girl but mad at him called him terrible names but still wanted him in her life so and and definitely made that Ricky's ruined Ricky's life for good so when Ricky got that email she didn't even confront him she just fell into a complete abyss psychologically she had was already clear from drugs and all of that after after the rehab and they didn't really help and as soon as she got that message she took the drugs that she still had in her room took all of them <clears throat> and overdosed and died horrific you know such a kind-hearted girl so that was a big wake-up call for the family and that made the father the adoptive father who loved her made him realize how bad the situation is with the drug use and with the peer pressure particularly yeah. pressuring peer pressure from other kids pressuring other kids into taking drugs and he said something that is very very true he said if if we have in schools if we have a zero tolerance law on drugs in schools and if if someone is found taking drugs and they are whatever wh whether they are taking the drugs inside of the school or outside of the school they need to be sent into a rehab and they need to be sent into a therapy program and it, there should be a zero tolerance in the whole school and the kids need to be monitored he said when the kids have this law when the kids know there's a zero tolerance on drug use they will not take them most of them will not take the drugs because most of them only take the drugs in the first place because they feel like if they didn't take him they would be excluded from from that peer group from that from their society from their kid kids groups and they would be looked down on they would be laughed about they would be shunned from hanging out with them and or ridiculed or bullied or whatever you know they're they're really peer pressured into taking drugs and he sees that very clearly because that's what 
what it was was his daughter, very creative, very, very sensitive girl. And when they're that young, you know, they are very worried and very concerned about what other people, what other kids think of them. And he said very clearly, if they have a zero tolerance law in the schools on drugs, then the kids that would normally be peer pressured, when they get peer pressured again at at a situation where there is a zero tolerance and there are consequences for being found with drugs. And they also need to they need to screen those kids when they come to school. They need to do a saliva test to see if they had taken any substance. Okay. So they need to be really monitored for that. And those kids that would normally be peer pressured they can then say, no, I don't want consequences. I don't want the consequences for those actions. And then they will not be ridiculed because then the only reason, their outward reason for not taking the drugs will then be, their excuse will be, yeah, I, I don't want to have the consequences happening to me. You know, I don't want to go to a rehab center. I don't want to be... I don't want to be kicked out of the school and I want to pursue my my school program and I want to get my degree and I want to go to university and so on. So that would help a great deal. That's what he said. And in the same sense, I completely, this makes total, total sense. The the therapy help centers that I would develop would be very much in this in this particular philosophy of of really outlawing all of these things. So I have four therapy help centers. One is the open clinic. And we will have that law, T total zero tolerance on drugs, any kind of drugs, and any kind of violence. Okay. And when that is in place, then people will behave better because they don't want to face the consequences of it. Okay. And even the tough guys that want to look tough, you know, if we have a mandatory clay figure making program for you, your inner child likes that. I know that. I know it does. Okay, but the outer layer, the the main consciousness, the conditioned man, yeah, the conditioned man says no. This is this is for girls, children, and gay guys. That's what they will say, you know. And then there's a lot of gay guys also that will also, for the same reason, not allow themselves to do this because they want to fit in and so on. And that's also why they don't come out of the closet. But that's another that's another subject altogether. But it all all of this, whether it's drugs or making clay figures, or whether a man is gay and doesn't come out of the closet. That's all based on fear and shame. And that can be worked on. That can be worked with. This is, the, this is the first thing that needs to be worked with. This is right there. That's your opportunity to work with that shame. you know, And, and face that shame. Uh, where does that shame come from? Obviously, it comes from your dad who shamed you. you know, which, a, which is a, an atrocity. It's a horror. It's an absolute horror. But the dad comes from his own shame, from his own trauma. Okay, it's a it's a generational loop. It's it's a perpetuation of this type of behavior, the bullying and all of that. So. This can be worked with, and when there is a mandatory 
clay figure making as there is a mandatory no drugs, absolute zero tolerance on drugs. There's a mandatory no violence, zero tolerance on violence. Okay, we we are nice to each other here. Okay, then the inner child can start to relax. The actual person, which is the inner child, that's the actual you. Whether you are a girl, woman, man, boy, straight or gay, it doesn't matter who you are. Okay, the inner child would like, would love that. Would feel, would love to feel safe to do these kind of things, to be yourself, and not have to conform to some kind of tough image that society has given you. You don't need to be tough. You don't need to be seen as badass or as he's bad, meaning good. No, it's not good. It's not good at all. Bad is not good. <laughs> I mean, that should go without saying. Good is good. Kind is good. Okay, You can be kind. You, you can be a big, chunky guy, straight guy. Right? Kind is good. Be kind. Okay, Women want that. Women want a kind, big straight man okay who's loving who holds them who's gentle that's what women want yet i see the insult community this vast vast society of straight men that have this idea that they need to be somehow mean and tough and ignore the woman and all of these psychological games that they play, they think they have to do that in order to get a woman. That doesn't get you a woman. Okay. What gets you a woman is if you're nice to a woman. And if she doesn't want you as a lover, then find someone who does. Don't fixate yourself on one woman, ever. Okay. Same goes for us. You know, we can't be fixated on one particular guy. I used to do that because I was naive and and very stupid. I learned a lot. You can't be fixated on one guy, or or men cannot be fixated on one woman whoever we love you know we can't be whoever we like we can't be fixated on that person if that person doesn't want us so i want a big guy who is a good father for my dog okay that's what i want i want a man who loves dogs I want a man who is not religious. That's another peer pressure thing with religion. I want a man who loves animals, who cares, who'd go out there and and rescue an animal. Like Lee Asher. Lee Asher is every woman's dream man. Big, burly, gorgeous looking, very masculine man who is ultra, ultra loving and compassionate. Okay, so being loving and compassionate does not stand in the way of masculinity, not at all. I find that extra masculine when a man is soft and gentle and loving and kind and caring and rescues dogs and sleeps with a dog in bed he always does that when he gets a new traumatized dog sent to him he 
or some people will tell him there there's a dog who needs to be rescued and he will go he will drive for many many miles for hours to to meet that dog pick that dog up and many of the dogs have been traumatized and when he has a traumatized dog that dog will first only st stay with him separately from the other group from the other dogs because he doesn't know how the dog might react the dog might be afraid of the other dogs so or afraid of the other people so he will just do socialization with that one traumatized dog for several days and sleep with the dog in bed under the blanket and hold the dog while he sleeps now that's to me that's a real man that's a man i can trust that's a man i can really love wholeheartedly like that's the man I want to fall in love with. He's already, that guy ha, has already lines of women, you know. That guy has become a celebrity now. And why? Because women want men like that. There aren't very many men like, like him out there. But, you know, obviously, I can't be fixating myself on getting that guy, you know, I can't, I couldn't, there's no way he's, I'm, I'm sure he has a wife or girlfriend and, and they're probably very possessive of him. I see wherever he goes, the women want to give him a hug and they hold on to him, they, they don't want to let go. <laughs> Oh, I totally understand. I would do the same thing. <laughs> I would cling to him. <laughs> but obviously we can't be can't be fixating ourselves psychologically on one person just because we see this awesome guy like, you know, with me was when I saw James Hetfield play this one slow song. I was really and again, a big burly guy, but with the gentle side, you know. I just, I really like that. Women like that. Women. That's why women fall in love with musicians, because a musician has a gentle side, or he couldn't be a musician. Unless it's a drummer, you know, like Paul used to be a drummer. So, but Paul has a gentle side, and, and that I absolutely love. Lars Ulrich is a drummer <laughs> from Denmark. Lars Ulrich from Metallica. He, ha he has a gentle side too, believe it or not. The women love him. And they l the women love every one of them. <laughs> so, But then when I found out that James Hetfield had, had murdered mother bears in Russia, I, I was done, completely done, completely finished. That completely ended my crush on him. So... My crush had lasted for a long time, but when when I when I saw that the whole picture of it, I was done. I don't want I don't want someone like this. I don't even want to have a crush on someone like that at all. Whether I can could have that person or not doesn't matter. I don't want that. I don't want an, anything to do with a person who has murdered bears or any animal. You know, I don't want to be around a hunter. When I got up today there was I saw the ears of a Bambi deer on the lawn. Bambi deer mother. Beautiful girl. Girl deer. Very big. Bigger even. Taller even than Kenny our Great Dane. 
with very tall ears sticking up and she was looking at me when I came out there and I said oh good to see you oh my goodness she was lying on the grass but with her head up on looking and I said, I have apples for you. And she was looking and she, she could understand that. She could understand me saying, I have apples for you. And she got up and she came a little bit closer. And I said, hang on, I'll go in the house. I'll, I'll get you the apples. And I got her a couple of apples and I gently rolled them over there, over the parking lot towards her. And she very slowly walked up to the apples, started to eat the apples with me standing there in the driveway. And that was so sweet, so sweet. So, oh, and then she looked at me chewing and she looked at me like, thank you. Oh, they taste so good, oh my goodness. They taste so sweet. Thank you, Nicola. That was very nice. So, the papa dog or European basset hound, he met a baby, bumpy dear boy, baby boy. I don't know if the baby boy was abandoned. He, the mother wasn't there. I, I'm scared for the deer. I always hear gunshots all around us day and during the day and during the night too makes me so mad and the papa that was the, the last year of the papa's life that was in the summertime the papa and that that bumpy deer boy they were doing like a tango dance papa would go up slowly to him and the, the boy would slowly walk back and then the papa walk, would slowly walk back again because he didn't want to, he felt intuitively that he scared him and he didn't want to scare him. And then when the papa walked away, then the Bambi dear boy walked towards the papa. And then the papa wanted to meet him, but then the Bambi dear walked away again. And that went on back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that was so sweet. I didn't have my camera at that moment. I wished I had filmed them. That would have, that would have been so nice. But I have filmed later on. I filmed that Bambi dear boy because he was hanging out in our garden for several days. And then a week later, I heard gunshots. And then I didn't see the Bambi dear boy anymore. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think the hunter got him. And the the Bambi dear boy he wanted to he wanted contact. He he saw the papa because papa had similar hair color. He saw the papa as as a friend someone to play with someone to interact with he was lonely that Bambi dear boy because I think the mother may have been shot and then and then the hunter shot him as well That's so sad and then the papa died about half a year later from a stroke and now they're all together they all they all took their space suit off and they went to the infinite and they're together now all the way out there past the Orion Nebula and Alpha Centauri <laughs> moving forward dancing, literally dancing with the stars and dancing with each other in the sky in the infinite cosmos that's, uh, that's nice 
at least they don't have to feel lonely or feel abandoned or suffer anymore. But it's real tragic when an animal is shot. I will not hang out with guys like that. I don't want men like that. So my therapy help centers, they all include mandatory clay, ma clay figure making. Yeah. You have to participate, you have no other choice. And then the inner child says, ah, oh, that's good, I have, now I have an, an excuse to my my main consciousness why I have to do this <laughs> so, because it's healing for you to do this okay. and then whatever people create is psychological yeah I already I already filmed him oh, film him, film him. Yeah, film how good he looks oh how good the baby dog looks oh yeah so good <laughs> so Whatever people make, you know, whatever they form with clay or whatever they draw or paint with crayons or with markers or pencils or acrylic paint, whatever they, they mold in their hands or paint or draw is a direct link to how they feel okay, and what's going on in their minds, what's actually going on. The stuff, the unconscious, the stuff that they don't want to talk about, the stuff that's even totally unconscious. There are many different layers of consciousness. Some, some of the layers of denial are very deliberate and very very calculated actually by the main consciousness mm -hmm. I want to like I want to suppress something and mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about this or that's none of their business mm -hmm. or that would make me feel ashamed if I talked about it but then there's another layer mm -hmm. underneath where whatever happened may be very traumatic or may be very, that may be so scary for the ego, for the main consciousness to reveal to anyone that they will actually suppress it to the point where they don't even, they're not even aware of it anymore. And that can be pushed down all the way into total unconsciousness, into the deepest layers of unconsciousness that the researcher Vilayano Ramachandran from from the University of San Diego he has done research on this and it goes all the way into into a, a subconscious state that's called anosognosia it's like a somnambulant type of deep unconsciousness mm -hmm. and all the trauma stuff is there in that very deep unconsciousness also trauma not just from this life but trauma from past lives mm -hmm. and trauma that had that we have inherited mm -hmm. through our DNA even all of that lingers in that very very subconsciousness children in children it is usually more accessible through play and stuff like this so for adults this has been shoved down with quite some force and was, was through a lot of fear and stuff like that these are also automated some suppression phenomena not not only I want to suppress this, but on a conscious level, but suppression phenomenal function phenomena function suppression suppression mechanisms that are very physical that are happening on a more physical level. 
the suppression itself is already happening on an unconscious level. Mm -hmm. So all of this is happening in humans. Mm -hmm. And in, in humans, this is happening more, much more than in other animals. Mm -hmm. They're much more neurotic. It's, no, it's part of no, being neurotic. And there's no judgment on it. Mm -hmm. This is just what happened out of the body and the, the mind, the brain, wanting to protect itself from further hurt, from further trauma, from further shame. It's not safe for most people to say what they really feel. For children, it's not safe. It's, it's not safe, this world we live in, because of the neurotic adults who have suppressed their own actual needs. Okay, They will not even allow their children to have their actual feelings and needs. So they make it unsafe for their children, and so they perpetuate this neurosis from one generation to another. It's, it becomes a sociological phenomenon. This is real serious, all of this. And we can heal that. Wars come out of that. Fight, murder, sadistic behavior. All of this comes out of that. Keeping people in solitary confinement. Yeah. That's an atrocity. Comes out of the prison guards and whoever runs the prison comes out of their own unconscious. It comes out of the way someone conducts themselves is a direct testimonial to what's going on inside of them. The suffering that is happening in silence inside of their minds. Okay. So they want to they want to just pass this on and they're not thinking about the consequences of this, what it has, the consequences for themselves. I mean, accumulated karma, for sure, but also they are, they are shackling their own inner child further and further down into unconscious abysses. And they're not, they're not happy with what they have done. The inner child, the real person, is not happy with what they do to other people or animals. That James Hetfield is not well. I've I've watched a lot. I was a, like so such a. I was infatuated with that man. I watched everything I could find about him. But it was also that also taught me something. It taught me that when I finally found out what he has done, that he's actually a sadistic person. I don't know whether that was him who I talked to, but someone who, when I was, when I started to, when I found out about this, uh, and I left comments underneath their video, someone came at me with utmost vengeance and said, leave him alone. He's a hunter. He likes that. Uh, and I said, why does he like to murder innocent beings? And that guy would just say, because that's what he likes to do, leave him alone. And I said, I'm not, I, I'm not tolerating that. I'm not tolerating murder of innocent animals. I can't tolerate this. But I kept on asking, why do you want to murder an innocent being? And then he didn't even know whether that was him or not. Whoever that was, <clears throat> he didn't know how to answer that. He doesn't even know. It's all unconscious. He doesn't know why he wants to do it. In the chat room, I asked the guy, why do you bully me? Because it makes him feel like a lion, he said. So that's the same thing. That's the same mechanism. You know, he has suppressed the inner child, and he suffers now. He suffers a great deal 
Okay, and he sees someone who is allowing the inner child. And those are the ones that he targets mainly, particularly. Yeah. Those are also the ones that he wants physically. Whether that's an adult, I know, depending on whether he's straight or gay, you know, he may also like a man who, who is childlike, but he definitely wants me, the childlike maternal woman, childlike adult woman. Uh, he wants, many of them want that, many of them want that. But I see the also, I see that a lot on the internet, they want, if a man is bisexual or gay, he will want a man who is childlike and he will be very attractive to a man who is childlike. And the straight men want maternal women like me who are also childlike, maternal, but which, which is, that is normal, of course, and that's completely normal because a maternal woman makes a good mother, of course. So that's built into us. But they want childlike because, particularly, because, and that's not very neurotic, to want childlike women. What's, what becomes neurotic is when they want childlike children. Okay. That's pedophilia. And that is neurosis, and that is a form of criminal insanity. Okay, so, and that's extremely neurotic, and that's extremely unwell. And when they want, when they focus their sexual attention onto their children or other people's children, mm. they they hurt those children horrifically. They make those children traumatized this is a slow trauma that happens so that those children are not able to live out their childhood the way they need to with play and with feeling safe and being goofy and you know to fall into your dad's arms like a goofy clown without this icky uncomfortable feeling you know, without this unsafe feeling of the dad looking at them funny, looking at them with a child perceives that, whether the person is actually flashing themselves or touching the child inappropriately, or just playing with the child, but with a mind state that is, that has lust. The child will feel uh, the child will feel the lust, and the child will not feel safe at all. And here, this is very embarrassing, but it's very interesting. I just recently, just the other day, at the other, when we were at the other house, I had an insight into my own childhood trauma. There was a man. I'm sorry, this is, sounds really, uh, this is not, I'm not incriminating anyone here, but I am currently in love with a guy on the internet. I'm not going to say who it is. I want to, I want to protect him, but he knows who I'm talking about. The guy was the magician eyes, and I don't know where this comes from. Okay. I don't know where this, I know perfectly well where this comes from. So, just had this insight at the other house that when I was a child, before my brother was born, so I was really like, I was a real little girl, like two or three years old. I could, I just started to walk and, and run around and all of this, started to paint. <laughs> so my parents had a friend 
His name was Carl. Carl. And I'm not going to say the last name. I don't know. I don't want to incriminate anyone. I, I like Carl. But when Carl came over, I ran. I ran as far away from him as I could. And I was hiding under my own toys. I don't know whether Carl found me there or not, but I don't have any memories of this. But all I would, I had this flashback where I remembered when Carl came over, I ran away into my room. I closed the door. I think I even locked the door. I hid myself under my bed, under my toys and so on. And I was afraid. I was, I felt traumatized. And nobody picked up on this. Nobody, nobody noticed this behavior. Nobody thought this was kind of odd or maybe, maybe Carl did something, you know, that made me feel like this. So, but I remember Carl, I mean, I remember him. He has, he has lifted me up many, many times and held me for a very long time, very long time. And he was breathing heavily. So that's already traumatic for a child right there. Okay. So that can cause severe trauma. And then what happens is, this is the embarrassing part that a lot of people do not want to talk about because then they feel like, oh, see, now you're, maybe it wasn't so, maybe you want that or, you know, but that's the biggest misunderstanding there is. A lot of girls who have been mistreated will then later on seek a guy who resembles this abuser in some form. This is a subconscious mechanism that's happening. And this is, this, I don't know. I think the way I explain it is that when we become sexually mature, our lust attaches itself automatically to that what has presented to itself, to us as lust when we were little kids. Okay. Carl came over, he had lust. He wouldn't I don't I don't know if he touched me inappropriately, but he definitely had lust. Okay. I could see that. I can remember his facial expression. Okay. And guess what? He had these mag magician eyes <laughs> that, the, that the guy who I have a crush on, who I'm in love with has as well. I even see that uh, same eye <laughs> in the tree in front of my window. That eye there, you know, it's uh, it's in the tree bark. It's a formation in the tree bark. It is what the tree bark does, you know. That's the tree bark can grow in whirls and, and patterns. And, and we can see faces in it and so on. And I see faces all the time. But I see this eye of that guy, of the of my childhood parents' friends and and the same magician I in the man I am in love with and I have I feel very attracted to and someone else will say, How can you be attracted to a guy who resembles a little bit that the guy who molested you? So but that's because our unconscious links up our, our own lust with that what, what has first shown itself as lust to us. So for as a child, it was very traumatic. And once we heal this, this, this particular fetish or whatever happens then, particular attraction, will heal with that once we heal this okay but uh, that's up and uh, that is that kind of stuff is 
very unconscious. This this kind of stuff is not healed in me, okay? And I talked about this before. I think it was the same guy. I'm not sure, but it was the same guy who had molested me in words, I think, in the chat room, and who has had lust while he was doing it, and then feeling molested, then the same association started happening in my mind and my psychology. So a lot of people will not talk about it because they think they're just too embarrassed about it. They feel like this is uh, this is not me. I'm not someone who seeks something like this. And, but, you know, and then a lot of women, they will be shamed for seeking something like this. But what the body is doing is just doing, the body is only associating that what has presented itself as lust to them, what they have known from childhood. And then later on, they think that is what lust is supposed to be. You know, I'm, I'm supposed to have lust for the magician I guy him. So yeah, it is what it is. I'm not playing it down. I am madly in love with that guy, but my my sub my main consciousness knows that that my main consciousness knows my my psychic inner psychic knows that guy's a criminal. Okay, also I don't know about that that guy, the friend of my parents. Yeah. But the guy I fell in love with is a criminal. So because of that, I can't meet him. This is a hopeless situation. This is real sad, all of that. So it's it feels bad. I feel like I'm in a prison and I can't meet the guy I want to hold in my arm. You know, I want the guy, uh, the guy that I really want, the guy I find sexy you know, and beautiful. And he is gorgeous. He is really gorgeous. He really is gorgeous. So, but I don't know whether I say this now because that is how I have been, I have been conditioned in this way or whether this is how, what my actual taste is. So I can't really tell it now. But I have this affiliation for big fat, big fat men who have this particular face. <laughs> and, and a lot of them are, and that guy, he had dark brown hair, and I think he had blue eyes. But the eye, eye color is not the, the most important part of it. But I like blue eyes. I, I prefer blue eyes, of course. Be, I don't know whether that's because of him, but that could be very much because of this first imp imprint of sexual <laughs> sort of, you know, <sighs> sexual energy that is thrown at you when you're a child. And then later on, you think this is sex sexual and you will equate that you will link that up with sex the sexual feelings and all of that with the lust and all of that and that's very strange and and a lot of our trauma is linked up in a sexual way for men and women for both I see men who have a sexual fetish for women that are, that are kind of dominating and there was one guy in the center and he was attracted to me <laughs> probably for that very reason because he saw that I'm not a pushover I'm kind of I kind of go crazy sometimes and I have anger and all of that. So then his his in, inner true feelings come up and he remembers I guess he must, you know, subconsciously I must remind him of his mother or some kind of maternal figure when he was growing up who 
was kind of dominating. Yeah. So, and then he links women up with, or he links lust for women up with women who are kind of dominating. So, this is happening. It's happening out there. I, I was friends with a woman who actually was a dominatrix in San Francisco. And that was very interesting. And she's very much like me. She's a, We both scored battle acts in that test. So, yeah. There are men who like that. <laughs> so, but there are also the same men even and many many more men who particularly like the child in me okay so they they really want a child and many of them would not take a child because they know better than that but they will be attracted to a woman who's very childlike and that's because they had to shut down their inner child. When they had to shut down their child existence when they were a child. And another great example is Michael Jackson. That's, that's a prototypical example for this because Michael Jackson was a very, very kind-hearted person. Yet he had, he had an he had a, a very strong need to be around children and and it also became a sexual thing so he only felt safe around children first of all because that's because of his violent father and he wanted he was attracted to children in in every level also sexually because because he had to shut down being a child that he was. He was not allowed to be a child. He had to be a performer, to perform for his dad, to, to become famous, to make his dad money, and so on. And he was so terrified of his dad that they all peed in their pants, literally, out of fear. I think he said he even threw up out of fear. They were so terrified of their father. What a horribly violent man. Uh, Michael Jackson was not violent. He was a very, very gentle, gentle, kind person. But very, very mentally ill. Okay. And the drug addict, he had to numb himself. The pain was overwhelming. The pain that has never, ever been addressed or worked with. Nobody helped him with this ever. Okay. Uh, I like him, you know, whether people like him or not. I like him. He is a good person. He's a good soul. He's an angel soul. And he had been very, very, very traumatized as a child. And it's very tragic, and that's why I want to create Therapy Help Center, so that we can help people heal these wounds, you know. And I think it's very important to incorporate making something with your hands, sculpting something, molding something, painting, drawing something. That is very, very important, not only because it's healing, like it is it's good, it's creative, but also to for the unconsciousness to show itself, to feel safe through this process, to show what's actually going on underneath. And then through this process, feeling, feeling more and more encouraged to actually talk about it, to cry it out, and to really process this in that inwardness meditation pro therapy process okay and uh, and heal it and become well and live your life the way you're supposed to live your life with wellness with happiness with peace with love with animals with with loving animals without shame without these feelings of shame that come from society loving 
whether you are a woman or a guy loving the dog you know the inner child wants to do that okay i've seen this i've seen a very violent kid one time came to our house that violent kid nobody helped that kid he was very violent i was talking about animal rights he instantly went into resistance because he he has been indoctrinated by his right-wing society and he also has been shamed and he thinks animal rights is also something a man shouldn't do or so all of these ideas that have been implemented in him and then when my dog Kenny Great Dane came up to him his inner child came out suddenly a young young man I don't know maybe 24 okay part Native American and when he saw Kenny his inner child came out he started to pet him over the fence he was all like completely immersed in Kenny and petting Kenny and loving him and and was excited and and was feeling good for the probably for the first time in his whole life right but then because we weren't friends with them we we didn't see them after that anymore they they brought us water because we had that was before we had the well and we pay, Paul paid them and they didn't even declare the money to the person they worked for they just took the money and bought drugs was it and then that kid that native american part native american part white kid later on because nobody helped him he started, he went, he completely snapped and he was living not far away from us and, and we heard the gunshots and he was just shooting randomly into his own house and shooting his tires out, shooting everything around him. I, I hope he didn't shoot an animal. So his friends came over and they had, they were afraid. They were like, what are you doing? They called the police and they they got him out of there before he shot himself and they put him into a mental institution so but in that moment when he met Kenny his inner child came out and he was you know he was no longer in resistance so he, the inner child needs this touch needs that love you see in you too no matter how suppressed you are no matter how much you have suppressed creativity and art flow and love and peace and and loving animals and and all the all the nice things that come you know was being a child child likeness and that's what that's how i want to end the video now friedrich nietzsche mm -hmm. said you first become a lion you have to you cannot be taking other people's crap. You can't be accepting a dictatorship, whether that's Dick Cheney or the Muslim dictatorship or the corporate dictatorship or whatever it is. Or Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and whatever, whatever these, whoever these corporate agenda players are. You know. So you can't accept it. You have to stand up. You have to become a lion. But that's not the end state so of healing. The end state of healing, the, the final destination is to make, to let the lion become a child. Then you have made it. When you, when you can be that child again, that you once were, okay? that you're supposed to be, even as an adult, you know, we have all kinds of responsibilities now and we have to act as adults but we also have to have the compassion and the and the awe of nature and the love for animals and for art that is the childlikeness that that we are supposed to be that we are underneath the armors of neurosis so when you heal the neurosis with the right methods, you can allow the inner child to be there again. Then you have, then you make the lion into the child. And then you have made it, then you're happy.
Okay. And that's what the meaning of life is. Okay. You guys take care. Bye-bye.